So what I'm going to talk about is how we are implementing Lambda expressions in the Java language uh, using Invoke Dynamic and tools from JSR 292. So if you think about how, how do we go about adding a feature like Lambda expressions to a language like Java, and of course the answer is with a crowbar. Uh, there are a bunch of questions you know, that pop up about how are we going to do this and how is it going to be surfaced and how is it going to be implemented on the JVM. So one of the, one of the obvious questions is, all right, we're adding a new kind of expression to the language. Well, what's the type of that expression? And most languages that started out having closures uh, have some sort of function type, arrow type, stru um, you know, structural type built into, the, uh, built into their type system. They have some notion of a function type. Well, Java doesn't have function types. We could add them. Uh, but unfortunately, we have erasure to contend with, and that, that's problematic. The JVM also has no native, unerased uh, representation of function types. We have method handles, but they're, they're erased. Uh, so there's not an obvious, uh, obvious thing to do. We're not able to obviously piggyback on anything that's already there in the language or already there in the VM. If you go through the exploration of, so, all right, what happens if we add function types to the language? Uh, that raises all kinds of representational questions of how does the language source code map to the bytecode? And this is a problem that every language implementer faces. So this, you know, all, all of us are faced with this problem. But the Java language has this problem a little bit worse. And that is because we have this extreme commitment to binary compatibility. So whatever we do to re implement and represent Lambda expressions in the bytecode is not just our implementation today. It's our binary interface for the rest of time. So uh, you know, th this just makes things a little bit harder because whatever choices we pick today, we're going to be stuck with for a very, very long time. So you know, one of the questions that comes up is, all right, if we are uh, going to treat functions as values, how is that going to be reflected in signatures uh, for fields and methods in, in, the, uh, in the JVM? Um, and how are we going to go about creating instances of these new values at the, uh, the JVM level? Um, and how do we deal with the horrible problem of variance that generics in Java um, you know, foists on us? Um, and we wanted to do all of this without making significant changes to the VM. So, you know, this is a largely overconstrained problem. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of not great solutions. And any solution you offer, someone in this room could very quickly point out all the things that are wrong with it. And that's true. There are things wrong with all of the possible solutions. And our job is mostly to pick the one that's, uh, that fits the best um, and kind of hold our nose at the, uh, you know, the things that don't work great. So one obvious choice is, well, just use method handles. The JVM has method handles. It's an obvious representation of uh, you know, functionality as value. Uh, so all we would have to do is have the compiler desugar lambda expressions to methods, take a method handle of that, and call that our uh, implementation of uh, our, our representation of lambdas. But here comes erasure <laughs> biting us. Um, if, you know, the, uh, if the JVM level signature for a method that takes a function from, say, string to Boolean uh, just shows up as method handle in the argument position, well, first of all, we don't know the types. We'd have to hide the types somewhere. Um, and second of all, we have this overloading problem, which means you wouldn't be able to overload two methods that took two different shaped uh, lambdas. So that's kind of a prob problematic. And you know, what, the, what this is really um, you know, coming back to is uh, there are these two separate concepts, which is one, how are we going to implement it? And two, how are we going to represent it in our binary, um, in our, as a binary interface? And what, you know, whatever the compiler, the Java compiler produces today, that's our binary interface, and we better be prepared to stick with that. And so just using an erased method handle type as our function type seems a pretty undesirable long-term strategy. Um, and you know, there are also lingering concerns about method handle performance and are they competitive with bytecode performance in all the cases yet and all that. And that's just sort of cloud hanging around in the background over this. So what we ended up uh, deciding to do is to sort of take a page from history, which is the way people have always simulated functions, uh, function types in Java is by making interfaces that have one method. Uh, interfaces like runnable or callable or comparator or things like that, where these are interfaces that have one method and uh, we basically treat them as functions. And they happen to be objects and their object nature is a kind of annoying vestige that um, you know, mostly gets in the way.
So if we say, well, this is how we've been doing it for all this time. This is what our APIs already have, you know, already do. Let's just do that. Let's give it a name and be honest about it. So we, uh, you know, kind of cast about for various names. At one point, we were calling them SAM types for single abstract method. Uh, the name that we settled on was functional interface. A functional interface is an interface with one method. Uh, and the uh, type of a lambda is a is the functional interface type. You can only use a lambda in the context where it will be converted to a functional interface. So you can assign it to a variable of functional interface type. You can pass it to a method that wants a, an instance of a functional interface. Um, and this actually works out pretty well, both from the perspective of writing APIs, because the APIs look like they always have, and consuming existing APIs uh, with the, the new language feature. So that actually works out really nice. So you know, in this example here, we have a functional interface called predicate which takes a T and returns Boolean. So let me, if I move this part, maybe that'll help. Um, and uh, you know, we have an example of a method here that takes a predicate called filter, and the argument of that is a lambda expression that uh, takes its input, and its body is you know, call that input, call the getAge uh, method on it, and compare it to the value 18. Uh, we also did some nice fun stuff in the Java compiler to let uh, you do some more type inference. The compiler figures out the types involved, so it figures out that uh, that the uh, argument of people.filter is a predicate of person, so therefore the type of p must be person, and you don't have to actually type it. It just makes things a little bit easier. Uh, so from a what does the source code look like, this is a perfectly reasonable answer. Java developers are happy with it. You know, minimal impact on the libraries. Everything's great. So on the other side of the story, uh, what does this look like from the runtime perspective? How does that Lambda instance actually get created? And how does this interact with other languages running on the JVM? So that's what I'm going to talk about here today. So if we decide that uh, Lambdas are really just instances of some functional interface, the next sort of obvious way to do things is to say, oh, well, how about let just let Lambdas be syntactic sugar for inner class instances? Um, and certainly that would have been easy. It would have been easy to spec. It would have been easy to implement. You know, we could have been done you know, in five minutes. Uh, but of course, it's much more fun to make things complicated, so we did. Um, the, the reason that we chose not to do this is simply inner classes are clunky. They're not just syntactically clunky. They're clunky across the board. And we did not want to bake this clunkiness into our binary interfaces going, going forward forever. Uh, so when you capture a lambda, when you eval when you um, uh, you know, when the compiler encounters a lambda expression and it wants to, you know, evaluate it as a value, not invoke it, but evaluate it, uh, we call that capture. The, you know, with this translation strategy, capture is basically invoking the constructor. That means we have one class per lambda, inst you know, for, per lambda expression that appears in the source code. That's one of the yucky things about inner classes that we'd rather not carry with us forever. Uh, we would like to improve the situation over inner classes um, and not be stuck with their behavior you know, forever. And so this is another sort of obvious implementation where we're, we'd be conflating a binary representation and an implementation detail, and we'd like to separate those. So stepping back, you know, we haven't historically made this big distinction between binary uh, representation and implementation because we haven't had the tools to do so, but we do now. Uh, so, you know, of the various implementation choices, inner classes, they had too much baggage. Um, method handle has this erasure problem. Um, and we certainly don't ever want to change the representation because that would force users to recompile uh, their, their Java source code, which we don't want to ask people to do. We want class files to work forever. So we want to have a binary representation that says, this is a lambda, without committing to how are we going to generate code to implement it. Um, and of course, the answer to every you know, question in computer science is another level of indirection, so we'll do that. So instead of having the compiler emit code to create the Lambda instance, uh, it emit, emits code that basically describes the Lambda instance and leaves for runtime the, uh, uh, the actual task of, uh, of creating it. And then the runtime can use a translation strategy that it deems most appropriate, that could change over time, that could be JVM specific, and as long as it's fast, you know, we're, uh, we're happy. And so the tool that we're using for this is Invoke Dynamic, which is interesting because uh, Java is a statically typed language. So it, it's, um, you know, when, when we started working on Invoke Dynamic in, in, uh, in the JVM, 
our, our primary focus was on enabling dynamically typed languages, making things easier to do method linkage for dynamically typed languages. But it turns out that it's also a great tool for doing linkage in statically typed languages. And uh, you know, it's, it's basically your compiler writer Swiss Army knife, so you know, we're going to use that too. So even though all the types involved are static, what's dynamic is our code generation strategy. And we want to defer our choice of code generation strategy to runtime without paying this big penalty for it. Um, and so what we use is uh, when we want to evaluate a Lambda expression to turn it into uh, an instance of one of these functional interfaces, uh, what the compiler emits is an invoke dynamic call, which you call that thing, and the return value of that thing is your Lambda instance. So a uh, little bit of terminology here. So that call site, that invoke dynamic call site, we call that the Lambda factory. You're calling this thing to have it give you a Lambda. Um, we invoke it with invoke dynamic. And the bootstrap method for this invoke dynamic call site is part of the platform runtime. It's something that lives in Java Lang invoke. And we're calling that the Lambda meta factory. This is the thing that knows how to link the factory call site. And the linkage behavior can change from you know, um, one run of the JVM to another. Uh, so, an invoke dynamic instruction has two argument lists. There's a static argument list, which includes all of the things that are statically known in compile time. What is the type that we're converting it to? What is uh, the uh, what method implements the behavior that we want to uh, that you know that we want to uh, represent? H how many and what are the types of the uh, arguments that are captured, if any, by this lambda? And then the dynamic argument list are the actual values that are captured by the lambda, if any. Um, and so when you first go to capture a Lambda, you invoke this invoke dynamic instruction. The bootstrap uh, method gets called to link it. And uh, that's when a translation strategy is chosen. Um, and then from then on, uh, subsequent captures are going to bypass this slow path. And, uh, and, we'll have a, you know, and we'll link to a fast path, or if we're lucky, a faster path. And I'll talk about the, uh, some of those choices. So the first thing the static compiler has to do when it encounters a Lambda expression is turn it into a method. So that's easy. Uh, we're, tr we're, turning, we're converting this Lambda expression to a functional interface, let's say comparator of string. So the, um, the signature of that method has to be pretty much the same as comparator of string. Uh, and it may have a few extra arguments to accommodate any captured arguments. Uh, so if, if the Lambda captures things from the local context, you'll have a few arguments for captured uh, values, and then the arguments that belong to the target type. So for example, here uh, you know, we've got an example where we have a lambda that we're converting to predicate of person. So predicate of person takes a person, returns a, a Boolean, and uh, you'll see that the body of the lambda captures something from the local context. That's the free variable k. And so since it's capturing one thing whose type we know to be integer, the signature has to have a place to put that. And so when we desugar it to a method, we say, OK, this is going to be a private static method. Um, it takes uh, one captured argument, and then the arguments that are part of the, uh, the target type, and it returns the, target, the uh, return type of the target type. So this is pretty straightforward. Uh, in the happy case where you capture nothing, the signature of the desugared method is exactly that of the, uh, of the target type. Uh, if uh, there are cases where uh, if you're capturing um, the, uh, the object identity, the, the, the this value, the receiver, uh, we will desugar it into an instance method ins instead of a static method. Um, but, uh, but, but the desugaring strategy is really straightforward. You basically figure out what's being captured, and you use that to distort the sort of simplest static, uh, um, you know, static method that matches the target type. Uh, so then, um, when we actually you know, want to evaluate this thing, we, uh, we do an invoke dynamic invocation. The static arguments, like I said, describe the target type, which is predicate, and the behavior, which is this desugared method. Uh, the dynamic arguments, if any, they describe what's captured. And the result, um, when, you, when you invoke this thing, is a Lambda object. So I've kind of made up some syntax for what an indie call looks like, since we don't have that in Java. So we say we're doing invoke dynamic. The bootstrap is the standard Lambda meta factory. Um, it has two static arguments. One is a method handle that describes the single method of the, uh, of the type predicate. So here we're using a method handle not for its behavior, but just to describe its, uh, its signature and its type. 
um, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And then the, uh, the second argument is a method handle that describes the behavior that we want to bind to the single method of that, uh, that target type. And then the dynamic argument list is the one in, uh, in parentheses, is just the captured value k. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what the Java compiler is going to emit when it says, I want to take this lambda, which captures one variable k from the local environment, and converts it to a predicate of person. This is what gets emitted. Okay, so the, um, the bootstrap method, what we call the metafactory, has a pretty simple API. It's your standard three bootstrap arguments that every indie uh, bootstrap gets. The, the lookup, the, um, uh, the name and type of the invoked uh, method, and then two more arguments. A method handle, which is a descriptor for the target type we're converting to, and a method handle for the, uh, the behavior that we want to bind that method to. And the thing returns an object that implements the, uh, the, the, the target type. So this is kind of an interesting little trick uh, you know, in that we're using method handles not just to describe behavior, but also to describe um, signatures. It just turns out to be a really convenient way to do it, rather than having three or four uh, arguments to, you know, to the, the metafactory. We can collapse them all into one. And one of the things that we're doing in JSR 292 for Java 8 is a um, simple API for taking a method handle that is a constant method handle, one of the nice forms of method handles that comes out of the constant pool, and cracking it into uh, its constituent nominal parts. What's the, what's the enclosing class? What's the method name? What's the method type? And what kind of method handle is it? So it's a little uh, sort of very simple uh, method handle reflection API that lets us uh, use this as a way of uh, compressing down the argument list. Now, one of the things that we did here um, is we chose the semantics of this metafactory inv invocation to map very cleanly to a set of method handle behaviors. Where, um, and the reason for that is we want the VM to be able to intrinsify these invoked dynamic sites and say, all right, that's an invoked dynamic, but I know that bootstrap. That's the Lambda bootstrap. And I know that I can intrinsify that. I know what the semantics are. I know it's side effect free. And so I can do all my code motion optimizations and box on box optimizations. So hopefully, we will be able to accelerate Lambda capture even beyond what Invoke Dynamic gives us today. OK, so now that we've set up our extra level of indirection, now we have a choice about how are we actually going to take this method um, and turn it into an object. And you know, there's a whole pile of candidate strategies. One of them is have the metafactory spin bytecode for something that looks like an inner class at runtime. Um, that's basically generating the same code the compiler would, but now because it's not being burned into statically generated bytecode, this is a pure implementation detail. It's no longer a representation. Um, and then what we would do is link the, uh, the factory call site to the constructor of that spun class so that the next time you capture that same lambda, you're just calling the inner class constructor. Um, and you know, this works because the dynamic arguments and the um, constructor arguments turn out to have exactly the same uh, set of types for obvious reasons. Uh, so this is our kind of initial out the gate strategy because it's simple and it works. Uh, it's not necessarily the best possible strategy, uh, but because we're able to uh, do this now and do something else later because we're, we're, we've committed to uh, a fixed uh, you know, binary representation that uh, has this indirection baked into it, it's reasonable for us to start here and then go from, go from there. Another way we can implement this is for each functional interface type, like runnable or callable or comparator, spin one wrapper class whose constructor takes a method handle and link the, um, the call site to pass the behavior method handle to, um, you know, to the constructor of that, uh, of that class. And that gives us uh, a little bit less uh, class loading pressure. Instead of loading one class per lambda, we're loading one class per uh, type of lambda. So one class for all the runnables, one for all the callables, uh, which you know, results in many, many fewer classes being generated. And again, this is a pure runtime implementation detail. There's other strategies we could use too. We could use dynamic proxies, not that we would want to, um, or you know, even some VM private API for const you know, constructing objects out of raw bits. You know, uh, it's all, since this is all pure implementation, we could do that if we had a, a faster way of constructing objects in vtables.
So, you know, this is kind of nice. We have a lot of choices, uh, and we can choose between them purely based on performance data. We can switch between them when the performance data changes. Uh, we can do one in, you know, the initial version of 8, and a different one in 8U1, and a different one in 8U2 if we wanted. Um, you know, J9 can choose a different strategy than Hotspot. Not a problem, because we have the same binary representation. Okay, so let's look at what Indy is giving us here. Uh, one of the things Indy is giving us here is um, free lazy initialization. So it's really common pattern in Java source code. If you have, say, you know, a comparator that compares two people by last name, well, this is a stateless object, and so you don't want to create a new one every time you want to sort a list of people by last name. So what people do is they hoist it into a static field. You know, final, static, private, blah, 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 comparator equals, and then and they, uh, they do that. Um, for stateless lambdas, we can do that automatically. So uh, if lambdas don't capture anything from the um, local environment, they only ever need one instance. So at first capture time, we can just create an instance and then link the call site to say, always return that instance. Don't create anything, don't allocate anything, you know, just uh, constant load. So you know, this very common case of lambdas that capture nothing, uh, they boil down into constant loads. And that's, uh, that's really effective. Um, and you don't have to muck up your source code with the, you know, uh, to hoist things into fields. Um, and it's at, we're actually better off this way than ho over hoisting it into fields. Because if you hoist it into a static field, now you have a static initializer that has to run, even if you're never going to use that comparator. Whereas if you, uh, if you do it at first capture time, you only pay the initialization cost if you're ever going to use it. So, you know, Indy functions as this nice, lazily initialized cache where, you know, you get all the benefits of lazy initialization. You uh, initialize the thing once, it's all, you know, thread safe, and the overhead is zero if you, never, uh, if you never use it. So that's kind of a nice thing that we just pick up for free is that stateless lambdas, which are really pretty common, you know, lambdas like, you know, x maps to x plus one, doesn't capture anything. Uh, that just, you know, we, we, we automatically pick up the, uh, you know, um, fly weighting those and lazy initializing them, you know, for free. So that's kind of nice. So what else did Indy give us? Um, you know, it's been, you know, it gives us an opportunity to defer a really important choice to runtime without paying this huge performance penalty. So, you know, what was a big deal because it was a, a, a representation choice now becomes a pure implementation detail and it allowed us, you know, to, um, to dynamically choose our translation strategy. So not dynamic typing, but dynamic choice of compilation strategy. Also interesting um, and you know, valid use of dynamism here, and Indy supports that pretty nicely. So uh, what we've effectively done is move more of the work from the static compiler to the, the runtime compiler. And as you know, the runtime compiler is always smarter. So. Um, and this also gives us the opportunity to you know, change our code generation strategy whenever we want. You know, every alternate Tuesday, we make lambdas differently. That's okay. So basically, Indy is one big, you know, extra level of indirection for us. And, and so, you know, even though we're able to defer this choice of how to do the code generation to runtime, we're not paying the price on every call because uh, once we link the call site, we either link the call site directly to a constructor of some generated class, at which point it's, it's no more expensive than it ever was from then on, or we link it to return this known constant, in which case it's much cheaper than it would have been under the inner class strategy. So, you know, this works out really nicely. And, and the, uh, you know, this non-capturing case, this is a big, big deal uh, because so many lambdas are non-capturing. I have some performance numbers I'll show a bit later, but if, if you link, uh, if the Metafactory links a call site to a constant call site whose value, whose re return value is a constant combinator, uh, the VM just optimizes that into a constant load and the, the cost of capture just goes away. So that's, um, you know, that's really nice. And then in the, in the bad case, all we have to do is link the call site to the constructor of some generated class, and we're no worse than we were in the inner class case before. All right, so let's talk about how this performs, because uh, we actually have numbers on this now. Um, so there's a couple of layers of performance cost here. Uh, there's uh, the one-time cost, the linkage cost, which is what does it cost to run the bootstrap, or if you're doing inner classes, what does it cost to go out to disk and read the bytecodes off disk? Um, you could argue that this doesn't matter because it's a one-time cost, um, and that, that's sort of true, but um, it, it's, it's really easy to, um, you know, to see all of the code generation work we're doing at runtime and say, wow, that must be expensive. Well, going out to disk to read bytecodes off disk is also expensive. Um, and, you know, once you have the bytecodes, you have to do the same class loading activity either way. 
Um, and uh, this also gives us an opportunity to do more class sharing and class caching. So we'll probably be doing less, uh, less class loading overall at linkage time. Uh, the really interesting costs are the capture cost and the invocation cost. So the capture cost is the cost of turning a lambda into one of these objects. The invocation cost is, one of, uh, is the cost of uh, invoking the lambda. Um, so in the uh, sort of uh, you know, just map everything to inner classes strategy, the linkage cost is go to disk, get the bytes off disk, and load the class. The capture cost is invoking the constructor. And the invocation cost is the cost of the invoke interface uh, instruction. So we had our performance team take our prototype uh, that uses the generate classes dynam inner classes dynamically at runtime behind an indie bootstrap um, and compare that to the cost of the regular inner class strategy. And so you know, we ran this on a monstrous machine, you know, 4 by 10 by you know, 80 thread in a Halem server. So these numbers, I know Cliff is shaking his head because he says that's not monstrous, but it's, it's it's a big machine. Uh, it's an expensive machine, anyway. Um, and uh, you know, these numbers are operations per microsecond. So what we were hoping to see, and this is in fact what we did see, is that the worst case time under the Indy strategy is exactly the same as the inner class strategy. And the best case time is much better. And that's exactly what the numbers bear out. So, so let, me, let me unpack this table for you. We have um, three, uh, three rows. The first row is, what does it cost to capture an inner class? which is basically the cost of invoking the constructor, setting up one or two field, final fields, and the memory barrier that, that, that comes with that. Uh, the second row is, what does it cost to capture a lambda that doesn't capture anything from its local en environment? So that's like, you know, stupid lambda like always return true. And the third one is, what does it cost to capture a lambda that captures one, f one value from its local uh, environment, like the, um, the predicate example I gave earlier. So the columns are uh, cost and operations per, operations per second um, in the single-threaded case, in the run this as hard as you can on all the, uh, the cores case, and then the last one is uh, just the uh, dividing uh, the second column by the first column to give you the scalability. So what we see is uh, for just raw inner class um, instance allocation, we were getting 160 instances per microsecond. Um, and uh, in the um, and and when when running on all on all 80 threads, we were getting 1,400 per microsecond. So that gives us about a 9x scalability on a machine that has 40 physical cores. So obviously there's some kind of bottleneck going on here. In the happy lambda case, on the single-threaded um, version, we saw 630 operations per microsecond. That's a factor of about five better. I guess a factor of about four better. Um, than the um, than the inner class case, and on the all on the all cores, we got a much bigger factor. We got much better scalability. Basically, almost the full forty to one, you know, uh, of the physical cores that we had. Um, and then when we fell back to a lambda that captured something, we fell back exactly to the performance of inner classes because that's all the indie site was doing was linking the call site to the constructor of inner class. So what this means is. Um, our worst case is exactly as good or bad as the dumb just map it to inner classes strategy, and our best case is between five and 20 times better. And the best case happens a lot. The best case happens, you know, depending on your numbers, um, you know, probably more than half the time. So, you know, this is a huge, huge uh, performance win. Um, so, you know, this, this really sort of uh, dramatically validated our strategy. So this is pretty cool. OK, so um, this is not just the Java Language Summit, but the JVM Language Summit. So why do uh, developers of other languages care about this? So the Lambda conversion metafactory, the thing that takes a method and turns it into a Lambda object, is going to be part of the platform runtime. It'll live in Java Lang Invoke. Um, and yes, the semantics are very much tailored to the needs of the Java language, but it's likely to be useful for other languages too. So uh, for example, the Java libraries are full of um, methods that take single, single method uh, interface instances, you know, comparators and such. And so if you want to use the Java libraries, you're going to be creating these objects anyway. 
So rather than generate your own inner classes, you can do the same thing that the uh, Java compiler does and call out to this, um, you know, to this platform API, which, like I said, in the worst case is about as slow as inner classes, and in the best case is a lot faster. So uh, since you're likely to have to be doing the same thing, make this part of the platform runtime, um, and it's certainly easy to use, and maybe you'll pick up a performance boost uh, for free. So uh, not just for the Java language, something everyone might want to use. OK, so what, um, what do we want out of the JVM to make this uh, faster? Well, one of the things that the VM could do is intrinsify these capture sites, where the VM could say, OK, I know what the semantics of that invoke dynamic instruction are. That's just this little bit of method handle arithmetic that I know how to do. And if internally we intrinsify that and, um, uh, and have you know, an, an IR node representation for that behavior, now we can do code motion on it, and uh, we can defer the capture until we know the thing's going to be called. We can do uh, box unbox style elimination. If you treat uh, capturing a lambda and converting it to an object as a kind of boxing operation, all the same tricks you can do with box unbox elimination on box primitives, you can do on box lambdas. So uh, you know, th th there's a lot of room for the VM to make this even faster. Right, John? Yes. All right. Uh, so. Yeah, you know, so, so the way to think about this is turning, t taking a method and turning it into an object is a box operation. Box operations are a pain. Uh, but because we, can, we, we get to define the semantics of the, the box operation um, you know, as, part of, uh, you know, as part of this activity, we can define it in such a way that we can do box elimination on it safely without you know, falling afoul of lang language semantics. Um, and then you know, some really cool things that we can do. We intrinsify the capture. Once, once you, uh, let's say you pass that into a method, you inline through the method, you do some escape analysis, you figure that, hey, I'm making this lambda, and the guy I'm calling is just going to call it. Why bother making the lambda at all? Just pass the method handle through to him and let him invoke it. So in that happy case, the cost just all goes away. OK, so no language exploration in Java is, is, is uh, ever free from some interaction with serialization. Serialization is by far the worst language feature ever in <laughs> any language that escaped the cradle. And you know, painfully, you know, the expert group probably spent 30% of our time uh, beating our heads against what are we going to do about serialization. And as much as we all wanted to say, ignore it, ignore it, we couldn't do it. Uh, because users are going to expect this code to work. If you have some functional interface that extends serializable, and someone takes a really dumb lambda and converts it to, to one of them, and they're going to want to serialize it, and they're going to be astonished when it doesn't work. And we don't want to astonish our users in a bad way. So um, we have to deal with this. Uh, because we're generating the classes at runtime, we can't just serialize the generated object, because when you go to deserialize it, the class won't exist. So, um, and even if it did exist, it might be that that VM is using a different translation strategy. It's not mapping it to inner class-like things. It's wrapping it to, it's you know, representing it as some, you know, use some VM alchemy to create you know, objects out of raw bits. So uh, this means that we need to have a dynamic strategy for serialization, just like we have a dynamic strategy for translation. And we need one that doesn't expose any new security holes. right? Because we, uh, you saw in the desugaring example, we wanted to desugar to a private method. Why? Because we don't want to expose these lambdas as public entry points. But serialization is basically a public entry point. We didn't want to create any privileged magic that would take an arbitrary private method and try to turn it back into a lambda, because that would be exposing a huge new security attack surface. So um, we need more indirection. That indirection trick is really good. I'm glad I learned that one. Um, so uh, you know, we have this class file representation you know, for, uh, for a lambda is not an imperative uh, but a, a declarative description of how to make a lambda, that's what our serialized representation needs to be also. Uh, fortunately, serialization gives us hooks for that. Read, resolve, write, replace. It gives you a chance to intercept the serialization and deserialization. So thank god that's there. So instead of serializing the lambda directly out, what we want to do is serialize an object that reifies everything that was present at the invoke dynamic site. The, uh, you know, the, the, the target type I'm converting to, the, the, the name of the behavior method, uh, as serial, serialized versions of any captured dynamic arguments. And so there will be some class, you know, let's say call it serialized lambda, and the, um, the write replace method will uh, 
uh, we'll intercept the serialization, turn it into one of these, and we'll serialize that out. And then on deserialization, the only little bit of privilege magic we need to do is say, all right, what class originally captured this lambda? I'm going to ask that class to reconstitute the lambda so that the, um, the, the, boot, the bootstrap uh, the language runtime doesn't have to do any uh, privilege serialization magic. So uh, we hand that back to uh, the class that captured the lambda originally and said, this lambda says it was one of yours. If you agree, then do the same thing you did when you captured it. So all the responsibility for deserialization goes through the same code paths as the responsibility for original capture. Okay? And this means many fewer potential attack surfaces. So uh, there's a long description of how this works. I've posted it on the wiki. Uh, so you're all welcome to go read it. I'll just give you a quick taste of how that works. Is um, we record in the Lambda which class captured it, along with all of the other, um, uh, you know, the other information about it. And then we, uh, what the, uh, the runtime does is says, OK, you captured it. You deal with it. And that class is expected to have an extra method. We've given it a, a magic name here, dollar deserialize. Obviously, that's a placeholder for something. Um, and it's going to have to say, all right, well, I have this byte stream that might have been constructed by a malicious uh, interloper. Let me make sure it actually describes a lambda that I captured. And if it does, then I will go through the same uh, path that I used to capture it the first time. And you know, uh, so that if someone constructs a byte stream that has the name of some random private method, the, uh, the class who supposedly captured it will say, well, I never captured that method as a lambda. I'm not going to turn this into an object. So it's, it's kind of a nice trick where we take the responsibility for deciding whether the lambda is valid, and we put that back on the class that captured it and have it generate some bytecode uh, to, to do that validation for us. OK. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of details about serialization. Um, some of you wish, uh, think, probably think I've already said too much about serialization. So out of mercy, I'll stop on that. But if you are interested, the details are all in the paper. And that's up on the wiki already. So last slide. So I see Alex shaking his head. Um, uh, no JVM Language Summit talk would be complete without um, adding to John's wish list. So uh, I have here a little slide, a modest list of things that I would like from the JVM. Um, you know, one, one of them, as I've already mentioned, which is uh, intrinsification of the functional interface conversion that converts a method into a, a Lambda instance. Uh, that would be really nice. Uh, that's a pure performance thing. Um, but you know, sort of look, looking at uh, you know, looking at sort of how this is going to get used in the libraries, uh, it's kind of frustrating that we have this great trick for turning um, stateless lambdas, uh, capture stateless lambdas into constant loads. And there's all sorts of things that are only like one step away from that. And I want to turn them into constant loads too. So for example, if I have um, you know, some, uh, some class that is really just a value container, and all it's doing is holding a reference to one of these lambdas, why do I have to create a new instance of that every time I want to do that? Why can't I say, this class is a value, a value carrier. I'm invoking its constructor with things that are constant time values. Why can't I treat that invocation as a, as a constant as well? So you know, we have this expression tree, and we have this nice constant capture behavior at the leaves, and I would like to be able to have that behavior flow all the way up through the tree. So, uh, so that's kind of um, you know, one of the items on my wish list. You know, this is something that shows up in functional languages all the time. You have these. Um, you know, you, you, you have this uh, you know, big composition of, of, of behavior where the only data are constants at the leaves. And it would be nice to turn that whole thing, fold that whole thing into a constant, just load it right out of the constant pool. Or lazy, lazily initialize it and load it out of the call side. Um, the other thing on my uh, invoke dynamic wish list is um, more control over uh, the state of the uh, call side linkage. So the default behavior, what we have now, is you know has to be the default behavior, which is um, you know when you clone the call site, when you inline through a call site, and you and you copy it, they share the same linkage state. That makes perfect sense. But there are times when you're using the call site state as a cache, and you would like to cache not the um, the last uh, last thing anybody used, but the last thing someone used through this code path. 
So there are some huge opportunities for improving the hit rate of inline caches at Invoke Dynamic if we had some fine level control over, you know, when you clone this call site, just clear its call site state and link it again. Um, and, and that way, uh, when you link it, there's a lot more constant information available to the VM uh, that, that you can take advantage of. So that's, um, that's my big wish list item um, for uh, JSR 292. And with that, um, I guess I'm finished and be happy to take questions.